Welcome to Meet the Candidates. Today I have in studio uh, State Representative Michelle Dubois. And Michelle, tell me which district. Sometimes I get them mixed up. 10th Plymouth District. 10th Plymouth District. So you're running for re-election as State Rep. This yep. would You're running for your third term. Mm -hmm. And no stranger to politics. You were a city councilor in Ward 6 for 10 years. I loved it. And yep. then you graduated to the legislature, right? Um, but similar issues, just more on a statewide basis. Issues that go on a statewide basis that affect the district. And let's outline the district. The district is Brockton, all of Ward 6. Brockton, all of Ward 6. Um, two thirds of Ward 5. So that is 5 B, C, and D, precinct B, C, and D to be specific. And then in Ward 4, it's precincts B and C. So the way the precincts lay out is if you live in A, that's closer to the downtown. Mm -hmm. So I, do, I don't have um, three, I don't have uh, 5A or 4A or 4D. Okay, and then all of West Bridgewater the whole town. All of West Bridgewater. And then a couple of precincts in East? Precinct one. Just one. In East Bridgewater, yep. Well, that goes to the wonderful old gerrymandering. <laughs> uh, I, don't I don't know if your district looks like a salamander. But, no, I uh, think my district is pretty good. It used... It runs this way with the railroad tracks going here. And way, way back in the day, it used to run this way. But they've been dividing the city into three for state representative seats uh, for a very long time well, because to me, of our population. To me, we have three advocates and then we have a state senator. Right. It's like I always looked at the city council is you have your ward councilor and then you have four at largest. So you right. have five people representing you. So um, I live in. Claire Cronin's district, right. which is the job. 11th Plymouth district. It is, and we work as a team at right. the State House, the right. Brockton delegation. Well, you, you have to mm -hmm. because it's just like a sports analogy. If you know, someone's the quarterback, I don't know who it is, but the quarterback can't win a football game by himself. Right. I'm not a sports person, by the way. So and it's good to have a team. Yeah. So I played um, doubles tennis in high school and college. And I like having a team. I like being on the city council. I like having this group of people. And it's, you can be more effective that way because everyone's different personality traits and strengths and weaknesses can complement one another. So you were going um, during, before the summer started, before all the, you know, get your signatures again to get on the ballot. I know you have to get 150 signatures. Right. Okay, which means you have to get like 300 in order for the 150 to be good. I do get double. Because if there's a stray line or something mm -hmm. else, plus you want to know who your supporters are. So you went in to the election thinking, hey, I'm on a post. I don't have an opponent. Right, okay? well. And then 11th hour, I think, you ended up with a write-in candidate on the other side of the aisle. Republican. Republican candidate. Right. Were Republican, you surprised? Uh, you know, I, I was. I, I've been enduring um, a year and a half of uh, a TAC campaign on my character from this dark money group, Mass Fiscal Alliance, based in North Andover. They're super extremist right wing, uh, real nut jobs. And so they've mailed flyers into homes and perpetrated a lot of lies about me into uh, people's homes. And so because that was happening, I figured the Republicans had some plan, but when no one um, submitted the required 150 signatures to get on the ballot, um, I thought maybe they were just wasting their $50,000 they spent disparaging my reputation in my district, in my hometown. But um, as it turns out, they had more dastardly plans, and that was uh, they got themselves a pretty right-wing candidate to get 150 people uh, in his West Bridgewater town to write his name in, and that's that's a that's part of the law. It's legal, um, and that's what he did. So now I have an opponent, and I had to get my campaign together. We've, uh, it's, it's kind of hard to do because um, so many other campaigns are going on right now and people have committed themselves already and I think that was part of their dastardly plan. But we're gonna, you know, we're gonna overcome. I'm, we're knocking on doors. I've gotten a lot of volunteers. We're doing phone banks. Um, I'm getting really good responses. I just talked to my data entry person and he told me that 80% uh, of the response, responses I get are very positive. So um, 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 we're not going to take anything for granted, and we're going to work hard every day until November 6th. Well, I've watched you, Michelle, running myself before, but covering elections and everything. You're out there till the 
the polls close at 8 o'clock. You're getting yeah. people there. I saw you on the phone. I saw you. you what do you mean you didn't vote yet? I and they came stressed. down and yeah. they, they, they got there. At like 8, it's 7.50. Brockton's <laughs> been, not in your race, but Brockton in some of the races for council, for mayor, 55 votes, 6 votes, 12 votes, 1 vote, mm -hmm. 3 votes. It can happen. Look at, the, yes. look at the congressional race up in the 3rd Congressional District where it, it took them like about a week to figure out who had won that election. Right, exactly. And Brockton has a history of that. So every vote counts. I tell my oh, students all the time. Counts. you got to go out. And if you don't think that these people have an impact on your life, think about it. From a state perspective, okay, if you have three reps pulling for the community college, okay, maybe your tuition rates are going to stay a little lower. Right. Okay. We're going to talk about education is one of your right. key issues, and we're going to go to go to that next. But um, so. But to your point, with um, both the team analogy and um, being able to, uh, so the team analogy. East Bridgewater. Sometimes um, there are two state reps for East Bridgewater, and right. sometimes people say they just want one. But having two state reps is, in a lot of ways, a lot better because you have two people pulling for you. And you have two different parties, if I think. East yes, Bridgewater right is... now there's a Republican in that seat who really, um, because of the nature and dynamics of um, any bureaucracy, so the State House, the House of Representatives, there are something like 20 something Republicans of the 160 members. So um, a few elite Republicans in the top leadership positions get a lot for their district. But um, the rank and file members that are Republican get almost nothing. So, um, and that's no offense to them or their efforts. It's just the bureaucracy. Right. So sending a Republican up there um, is is really dooming your district to getting less um, extra funding in in what I've seen right. in the budgets that the four I've been through so far. So let's talk. Your top topic is my top talk, being a school committee member for Southeastern Volk. Schools, funding, equit equitability, I think I kind of botched that word, mm -hmm. but that's okay. Fair funding. There's, there's a lot of talk about the education funding formula. It was it goes all the way back to 93, okay? It's 2018, okay? Cities, towns, suburban, urban. So you represent both. You represent Brockton, mm -hmm. good chunk of Brockton. Right. The whole town of West Bridgewater mm -hmm. and the precinct in East Bridgewater um, what do you think about education and funding? I know you've been part of, you know, the Brockton Kids Count campaign right. in Brockton, and uh, it, you, you must get a little pressure on all ends. Well, the funding is so bad right now that um, every single one of my school districts um, is impacted by the formula. So uh, West Bridgewater is impacted. So there are four areas um, that there was a foundation budget review commission. So mm -hmm. a group of people came together, looked at the um, funding formula up at, up at the state house that they had, and in 2014 released this big uh, document called the Foundation Budget Review Commission Recommendations. It's a, it's a lot to say. And really what it comes down to is they looked at the w areas that the funding hasn't kept pace with the costs in our society or um, funding that maybe was never right in the first place. So the four biggest areas they found that were problematic were the amount that the state um, gives for health insurance isn't anywhere near um, what the health insurance costs, even though the state is supposed to pay, um, just to make it an easy example, the state is supposed to pay for maybe 50%, say. I, I don't know the exact number. And they give a number that they think based on um, old, it's supposed to be 50%, but the amount they give only covers 30%. And they Subject can't. Subject to appropriation might be the line. Well, because regional transportation is like that's that. That's like that, but this is different because okay. the formula is based on an amount um, that they thought projecting forward health insurance would cost, and it skyrocketed. Yep. And it was never really realistic in the first place. That was in the 90s. And the next is the cost to, for special education. So this, those two areas are areas that West Bridgewater, Brockton, and East Bridgewater will all benefit from because they all will get additional funding because of that. And then there is funding that it takes to teach a child that has English as a second language. Mm -hmm. Brockton has a lot of children that have English as a second language. And it's, it's been proven that they cost a little bit more to educate 
but if they don't get that little bit more, you see a lot of kids falling through the cracks. And mm -hmm. if we just give them a little bit more, they're going to be able to be self-sufficient adults. Like that's what the science and the studies have shown. So the idea of giving them a little bit more on the front end so they can get the English language under control and, and a good handle of it so they can learn math and science and history and go on to college and be able to support their families and all these important things that we want for people, we just have to pay a little bit more on the front end and that's why I was so proud to support the bill that we passed in the state legislature this last session I worked for to allow school districts to keep children whose English isn't advancing as quickly as we'd hope in um, segregated classrooms so they can focus on the English so they can then go in to math and history in the integrated English classrooms or English Spanish classrooms because what we're finding is like 75 percent of the kids can get right into the English classrooms because we have like an English immersion that's what we want right. we want kids in the classrooms so everybody is in learning together but a certain like maybe 25 percent of those kids when we do that they just needed a little extra time mm -hmm. in the segregated classrooms to learn the English before they could get thrown into history. And by not um, tailoring our program a little bit for those kids that just need a little extra time, we're throwing, we were throwing them into the history class, not so much in Brockton, but in some other places across the state, and sometimes in Brockton. And then they could never learn the history or the math because they didn't have a good enough handle mm. on the English. So the ESL and special education. Right. So those are the four areas that the state has found that we're underfunding our educational school system. And um, they say it's $2 billion across the state. Now, I guess if it wasn't for the legislative team, Brockton would have been in real serious trouble. Whew. You guys went back and mm -hmm. uh, took the concerns back to the state house, And luckily, 11th hour before all those pink, node, pink slips got executed. Right the system was put back in balance. But it's it's getting worse every year because so, yeah, this you gotta it, you're gonna have, probably have to do it all over again and then the, the you know the towns you gotta you gotta balance. See you, we get three reps. Uh, one rep is the just Brockton proper. Mm -hmm. That would be Jerry Cassidy. Claire Cronin has Easton. Right. So she has the same issue too. She has two communities. You have three communities. Right. It's 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 definitely a, it's definitely a challenge but if if it all work if they would if they would actually look at those foundation budget reform commission recommendations and implement would, them. Yeah. Our schools would benefit. Maybe. All schools would benefit, right? So Brockton would get forty. I, I went to a, um, a presentation last night at the school committee, um, and I believe it was forty-two million dollars. Brockton would get of that two billion dollars that would really substantially help our school children in additional funds. So when the school system was facing a $13 million, $16 million deficit going into this school year, there was a lot of stress everywhere. And I know that the city councilors looked at it and the school committee was very concerned and we were very concerned. And in the end, we were able to, um, the state delegation um, through the legislature and the budget, were able to um, get $6 million more for Brockton this year than last year. And two million of that came at the 11th hour, mm -hmm. like at the, at, in, when, the, when the House budget went to the Senate, yeah. at the very last minute, it got two million in on the Senate side, um, or we would have only been up four million. And uh, that made the difference between those 100,000, those 100 layoffs of teachers. Um, but all the school systems that are in the 10th Plymouth District have received additional funding through schools because I know how important it is. If you live in West Bridgewater, Brockton, or East Bridgewater, and you have a child in the school system, you want the stuff there that they need to excel. And so East Bridgewater has some of the, has the one of the lowest per pupil spending um, numbers in the state. So they, I mean, there are issues in every school district, but the issues in Brockton are the most dire. And so I'm concerned with all the school systems, but um, it's like, it's almost like comparing, it's not comparing apples to oranges when we're talking about um, someone's child in their school education because they are all equal no matter where you live. But when we're talking about the funding problem, it's like apples and oranges because $42 million shortfall in what we would be getting once these are um, implemented is a lot different than what West Bridgewater and East Bridgewater would get. But in the end, 
the goal is that all of our kids get the same opportunity, regardless of where they live, to be able to become self-sufficient adults. And it's going to cost us a lot less to teach them now than it is to get them up to speed when they're, you know, 20, 40, 30, and on their own. And they may have to rely on government assistance and ha live a less um, fulfilling life than they really could have if they just got that little extra help when they were in fifth grade. Or go down the wrong path and then we're right. talking about major costs for incarceration. Mm -hmm. That's a whole, that's a criminal justice issue. And they're we're, all connected, right? They are all connected, mm -hmm. they truly are. Um, another thing, if you, people want the same things for everybody. They want a good job, a good school, but they also want a good environment. Mm -hmm. I met you back in the day when you were fighting against the trash transfer station right. before you were even a city councilor. Yes. Okay? That's really important to you. And we've had environmental issues with, with landfills and mm -hmm. proposed power plants and all, mm -hmm. all sorts of stuff like that. Um, I know you have asthma yourself, mm -hmm. and Brockton has been one of the highest rated places for asthma. So I, I know that's a close second for you. Yes, well, in, in some ways they're connected because uh, it's funny that I'm dealing with these issues now as an adult because when I went to Brockton High, I graduated from Brockton High in 91, and I've looked at all the funding from, from the 90s till now on a spreadsheet and really studied it. Um, the funding was in a similarly terrible position, mm -hmm. and the funding didn't get fixed at that time until there was a court case. I think it was a 10-year long court case, and Brockton um, is threatening to bring another one. And I say, great, give us the leverage to get this problem fixed. But my goal is to fix that at the legislature. Back when I was in high school, the legislator who represented us in Brockton um, was the same person who's running against me right now. He had one term, mm -hmm. and he did nothing for Brockton when he was there, when he had his opportunity. And I refuse to let that happen today because, like I said, maybe Brockton school systems will get a little bit more money, but every single school system in this district will get um, increased dollars, and that will make a difference to kids in East Bridgewater, kids in West Bridgewater, and kids in Brockton. And I'm not going to wait um, until some court case tells me what's right and what's wrong. It, yeah. Brockton set the trend. It started off way back right. in the day when it was Webby versus Dukakis, mm -hmm. then it was uh, McDuffie, it was Hancock, Hancock right. and who knows what the next the name is going to be. Because the kids graduated. They right. all graduated. And that's so sad because you're only in sixth grade once. You're only in ninth grade once, hopefully. Class sizes and all mm -hmm, of that. That matters. So, so the environmental the environment. part. The yeah. reason that, because when I was a kid, I had asthma and I lived in Brockton too. So these two connections. So um, it's different to be an urban environmentalist than a suburban environmentalist. Now, I love conservation, and I think that's very important. In towns like West and East Bridgewater, it's critical, and I support that, and I work with conservation commissions, redoing um, rail trails, getting them more money for that. Um, but the environmental issues that Brockton faces aren't about trying to save trees. Um, it is about how... Um, bad actors in the community not all um not all of business people are bad or not all businesses that have some pollution are bad but some bad actors try to put terrible things like tire burning facilities in the village i was a kid and my worked with my mom and donna daly to yeah. try to help that stop that and we were successful i think i was like 10. Mm -hmm. um, and then when we worked to stop the garbage transfer station they wanted to bring garbage household garbage from newton and wellesley bring it in on trucks which is a lot of diesel dump it into a transfer station right next to the muck which is really a beautiful marsh that we call the muck and then truck it out to Ohio to dump in the mine of some other poor community's environment. And that um, would that would have been terrible. It was on the zone two of Avon's drinking water supply, which is a right. small town, and that would have poisoned that um, small town. And they specifically do this because if they put it on the line with an urban community, they think the people in the urban community don't have the wealth and the educational attainment level to have like a lawyer and an engineer and a scientist on every block that can do it 
pro bono because right. they care. Our folks are working blue collar jobs. I mean, we know this. We don't have this opportunity uh, um, to fight back. So they try to place these dirty facilities on lines, and then the town doesn't have any say, really, not much, in the permitting of it. So they really are calculated the way they place them, and it's called environmental justice. So they seek out low-income communities or communities that have high um, uh, non-white population rates or communities that have high populations of people that speak English as a second language. And they're devious about it. So they look for these types of communities because they know that permitting um, of toxic facilities in these types of communities has been found to be easier, even when on paper everything seems wrong. If it's in one of these types of communities, since the people there don't have the political connections and the money to hire lawyers and engineers, it's easier for them to, or, or sometimes they just support certain people to run for office, so they take the seat. And in, small, in towns like Brockton, cities like Brockton, it's easier for communities to find, for corporations that want to pollute the citizens to finance those things than in more, um, than other towns that they've found. So it's called environmental justice. And again, it's another example of um, these communities can fight back and they can say that we don't want this. But we need just a little bit extra. And that little bit extra is like notifications in the languages that are actually spoken in the community. And it affects the whole greater area. I oh, yeah. worked in Holbrook back in the day and it was the number 13 fund on, on the Superfund list, the EPA, That's the Baird scary. McGuire site. I think there's still trash transfer stuff going on in Holbrook Randolph there right is. now. There is. Okay, so it's it's not, it, 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 it never actually leaves because every time you think you're safe, it kind of resurfaces. Sure but they is. weren't banking that they had, you weren't an, an official then, but it kind of launched you into being mm -hmm. an official. I had just and come And people back. like Wayne McAllister mm -hmm. who said, you're yeah, so sue me. God bless Wayne. I'll never Wayne. forget him. I miss I him terribly. Him. I, uh, I think of him all the time. I just saw a picture that came across my Facebook of him dancing with his daughter at a wedding. But he and I had tons and tons and tons of conversations yeah, you about that. Yeah, were close, right? And, and just, it, it, it's so important. I had asthma temporarily. I didn't have it for a long time, but when you can't breathe, you can't breathe. And if you did the, the levels and the measurings and all of that stuff and this, I mean, I don't know what it is. I don't live in it, but it's one of your, one of your areas in Ward 4 landfill, sewage treatment plant. They wanted to put the power plant Well, that's there. why I was so proud that we were able to, uh, through a lot of pressure over a prolonged number of years by a lot of people in the community, we were able to pressure the state and the city to close the, um, the what I call the poop incinerator, but it's a human waste incinerator. So the wastewater treatment plant cleans all the solids, they call it, out, and they dry them out. And they used to burn them in a five hearth incinerator. They're only like there are only a handful left in the whole state because it's, it puts out mercury, arsenic, eight, um, seven tons of really terrible pollutants came out of that stack every year and we breathe them in. And a bunch of us, when this power plant came up, we got to know all these um, sources of this terrible asthma causing pollution and we started putting pressure to close them and found cleaner methods because it used to be every wastewater treatment plant had an incinerator. Right. And then all of a sudden, only low-income communities still have their incinerator. And Brockton has the fifth highest asthma hospitalization rate in the state for kids. And West Bridgewater and East Bridgewater kids have asthma rates that are higher than they should be because of Brockton um, not advancing and keeping that incinerator. So that closed in January. It's a big accomplishment we can be proud of. And there's a lot more to be done. So my brand of environmentalism is really focused on keeping our air clean, our water clean, our land clean, because of the negative health impacts that it gives to all of us. Um, be, you know, Cancer, a lot of times, is caused by environmental uh, background pollution. Um, people are linking so many ailments with this type of um, toxic air that we breathe. So um, that is something that I'm really, um, I always jump in all those fights against. We're still fighting the power plant 14 years in. It's in court right now. If that power plant was put on the table right now, it would not meet even a quarter of the uh, requirements that are now on power plants to be permanent in Massachusetts. But because it was put in 14 years ago, um, 
it is a dinosaur and if they want to change the design to be one that's in compliance with what the standards would be today they would have to start all over and if they did they still wouldn't be permitted because it's on East West Bridgewater zone 2 of its drinking water supply and it's too close to where people live based on today's standards. Mm -hmm. So there's just, we are fighting um, in Brockton to stop a 350 megawatt, which is gigantic, natural gas, frack gas power plant that in anywhere else, any other affluent community, it would have never even been proposed. And we've invested 14 years of our lives to stop this. And in a lot of ways, um, become targets. So Wayne McAllister, um, God bless his soul, passed on now. He was named personally and professionally $68 million mm -hmm. lawsuit. I was too. That went on for like five years. There were eight other people that were named personally and professionally. And um, Susan Nicastro was named personally and professionally. She was on, I believe it was the planning board. Planning board. Yeah. Now she's a city councilor. But beyond she and I, we're the only two that are still in public service. Everybody else, when they got smacked with a $68 million personal lawsuit didn't run again. And for our, um, for our, you know, gift, we get um, the multinational power plant corporation hiring PR firms to target us personally in the mail with lies. And so it is, uh, it's a labor of love because I know in the end, if you stand on the right side and you're trying to make this world a better place, sometimes people attack you and you just have to get broad shoulders because you're doing what's right. And that's what we're doing with the power plant. I got a five minute cue, I think two minutes ago. I may have three left. So okay. let's kind of cut to the chase and maybe do one more issue, but also talk about availability, your interaction with people, right. and then you can let people know how they can get in touch with you and, and help. So I have monthly office hours in Brockton, West Bridgewater, and East Bridgewater at the city and town halls and um, at the councils on aging. I do meetings, probably two or three meetings a week, either at a coffee shop or in someone's home about issues that they're experiencing. Phone calls, we have a log book that, that we track all of our constituent services in. Everybody gets their own page. There's a lot of issues, and this is really a part of the job that I'm most proud of because it's kind of like being a city councilor because these are the things that we did, only now I get to tackle even bigger issues. So I've helped um, people save their homes on numerous occasions by either connecting them with someone that could help them or literally going, just last week, going and sitting down with a 71-year-old woman whose house was going to be auctioned off the next week and helping her through the process. So I'm always accessible. Please feel free to call me at 774-274-1344. That's my cell phone, and I will do my best to help in any way or if you want to discuss policy matters. Um, so I've tried to be accessible, um, and it has been my favorite part of the job. And if you wanted to talk about another project that I'm really proud of, I'm really proud of the parks and infrastructure money. Having been a city councilor, I know how important it is to deliver money to the districts. So while I was a state rep now, we've been able to redo three playgrounds in Brockton. Um, we're working on the East West Bridgewater Rail Trail. Um, there's going to be a third basketball court um, built at East Junior High with lights. Yeah. And I'm, I have a plan to redo every single playground in the city. I told in you, my district. I told you 30 minutes wasn't enough, mm -hmm. but that's the, that's, that's the limitation. Um, third, 20 seconds, your pitch to the voters. My name is Michelle Dubois. I'm my second term as your state representative. I'm a Democrat. I'm the Democratic candidate for re-election. This district has 40,000 people in it. 30,000 of us live in Brockton and 7,000 of us live in West Bridgewater. My opponent is a Trump-styled extreme right-wing Republican from West Bridgewater who has shown little care for Brockton. So I hope that when you vote on November 6th, you uh, will look at all that you can on my website and what we talked about today and cast your vote for Michelle Dubois for re-election. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle, for joining us. Thank uh, you very much. Good luck on the campaign trail, and we'll see you on election night. I look forward to it. Thank you for joining us, and watch Brockton Community Access for continuing coverage of the state election on November 6, 2018. Thanks for watching.